second grade, I'm back with chapter two of Little House in the Prairie. I got my big reader version, so the pictures are gonna be a little bit bigger for us. Okay, what an ending to chapter one, oh my goodness. All right, chapter two. Camp on the High Prairie. Pa made camp as usual. First, he unhitched and unharnessed Pet and Patty, and he put them on a picket line. Picket lines were long ropes fastened to iron pegs driven into the ground. The pegs were called picket pins. When the horse were on picket lines, they could eat all the grass that the long ropes would let them reach. But when Pet and Patty were put on them, the first thing they did was to lie down and roll back and forth over and over. They rolled till the feeling of the harness was gone from their backs. And here's a picture of the picket line and there's Pa setting it up. And then you can see one of the horses is on his back like rolling over trying to get the feeling of the harness off. While Pat and Patty were rolling, Pa pulled all the grass from a large round space of ground. There was old dead grass at the roots of the green grass and Pa would take no chance of setting the prairie on fire. If a fire started in that dry undergrass, it would sweep the whole country bare and black. Pa said, best to be on the safe side. It saves trouble in the end. When the space was clear of grass, Pa laid a handful of dry grass in the center. From the creek bottoms, he brought an armful of twigs and dead wood. He laid small twigs and larger twigs and then the wood on the handful of dry grass and he lighted the grass. The fire crackled merrily inside the ring of bare ground that he, and he couldn't get out. Then Pa brought water from the creek while Mary and Laura helped Ma get supper. Ma measured coffee beans into the coffee mill and Mary ground them. Laura filled the coffee pot with the water Pa brought and Ma set the pot in the coals. She set the iron bake oven in the coals too. And here's a picture of the girls doing their jobs. Mary's grinding up the beans. Laura's getting water and putting it in the coffee pot. And then there is a picture of Ma cooking. And there's the covered wagon. And then in front of it is Ma cooking in the cook stove. So they're basically like camping, outdoor camping. It's amazing all the things they could do. Okay, Ma set the iron bake oven in the coals too. When it heated, she mixed cornmeal and salt with water and patted it into little cakes. She greased the bake oven with pork rind, laid the cornmeal cakes in it and put it on the, and put on its iron cover. Then Pa raked more coals over the cover while Ma slice, sliced fat salt pork. She fried the slices in the oven spider. The oven spider had short legs to stand on its own up at the coals, and that is why it was called a spider. If it had had no legs, it just would have been a frying pan. The coffee boiled, the cakes baked, the meat fried, and they all smelled so good that Laura grew hungrier and hungrier. Pa sat the wagon seat near the fire. He and Ma sat on it. Mary and Laura sat on the wagon tongue. Each of them had a tin plate and a steel knife and a steel fork with white bone handles. Ma had a tin cup and Pa had a tin cup and baby Carrie had a little tin cup of her own, but Mary and Laura had to share their tin cup. They drank water. They could not drink coffee until they were grownups. While they were eating supper, the purple shadows closed around the campfire. The vast prairie was dark and still. Only the wind moved stealthily across the grass and the large and the large and low stars hung glittering from the great sky. The campfire was cozy in the big chill darkness. The slices of pork were crisp and fat. The corn cakes were good. In the dark beyond the wagon, Pet and Patty were eating too. They bit off bites of grass with sharply crunching sounds. We'll camp here a day or two, said Pa. Maybe we'll stay here. There's good land. There's timber in the bottoms. There's plenty of game. Everything a man could want. What do you say, Caroline? 
We might go farther and fare worse, Ma replied. Anyway, I'll look around tomorrow, Pa said. I'll take my gun and get some good fresh meat. So Pa's saying there's good land, there's timber. That means wood, so they can build things. Plenty of game. Game is what they call like wild animals that they can hunt. Pa lighted his pipe with a hot coal and stretched out his legs comfortably. The warm brown smell of tobacco smoke mixed with the warmth of a fire. Mary yawned and slid off the wagon tongue to sit in the grass. Laura yawned too. Ma quickly washed the tin plates, the tin cups, the forks and knives. She washed the bake oven and the spider and rinsed the dishcloth. For an instant, she was still, listening to the long wailing howl from the dark prairie. They all knew what it was, but that sound always ran cold up Laura's backbone and crinkled over the back of her head. Ma shook the dishcloth and then she walked into the dark and spread the cloth on the tall grass to dry. When she came back, Pa said, wolves, half a mile away, I judge. Well, there's where there's deer, there will be wolves, I wish. He didn't say what he wished, but Laura knew he wished Jack were there. When wolves howled in the big woods, Laura had always known that Jack would not let them hurt her. A lump swelled hard in her throat and her nose smarted. She winked so fast she did not cry. That wolf, or perhaps another wolf, howled again. Bedtime for little girls, Ma said cheerfully. Mary got up and turned around so that Ma could unbutton her, but Laura jumped up and stood still. She saw something. Deep in the dark beyond the firelight, two green lights were shining near the ground. They were eyes. Cold ran up Laura's backbone. Her scalp crinkled, her hair stood up, the green lights moved, one winked out, then the other winked out, then they both shone steadily, coming nearer. Look, Pa, Laura said, a wolf. Pa did not seem to move quickly, but he did. In an instant, he took his gun out of the wagon and was ready to fire at those green eyes. The eyes stopped coming. They were still in the dark looking at him. It can't be a wolf, said Pa, unless it's a mad wolf. Ma lifted Mary up into the wagon. And it's not that, said Pa, listen to the horses. Pet and Patty were still biting off bits of grass. Okay, so here's a picture. Pa filling with his gun. And in the back, you can see a creature with eyes glowing. A lynx, said Ma, or a coyote. Pa picked up a stick of wood then and he shouted and he threw it. The green eyes went close to the ground as if the animal crouched to the spring. Pa held his gun ready. The creature did not move. Don't, Charles, Ma said, but Pa slowly walked toward those eyes and slowly along the ground, the eyes crawled toward him. Laura could see the animal on the edge of the dark. It was a tawny animal and bridled. Then Pa shouted and Laura screamed. The next thing she knew, she was trying to hug a jumping, panting, wriggling Jack who lapped her face and hands with his warm, wet tongue. She couldn't hold him. He leaped and wriggled from her to Pa and Ma and back to her again. Well, I'm beat, Pa said. So am I, said Ma. But did you have to wake the baby? She rocked Carrie in her arms, hushing her. Jack was perfectly well, but soon he lay down close to Laura and sighed a long sigh. His eyes were red with tiredness and all the under parts of him were caked with mud. Ma gave him cornmeal cake and he licked it and wagged politely, but he could not eat it. He was too tired. No telling how long he kept swimming, Pa said, nor how far he was carried downstream before he landed. And when at last he reached them, Laura called him a wolf and then Pa threatened to shoot him. But Jack knew they didn't mean it. Laura asked him, Jack, you knew we didn't mean it, didn't you, Jack? Jack wagged his tail and the stump of a tail and she knew. And she knew, he knew too. It was past bedtime. Pa chained Pet and Patty to the feed box at the back of the wagon and fed them their corn. Carrie slept again and Ma helped Mary and Laura undress. She put their long nightgowns over their heads while they stuck their arms into the sleeves. They buttoned the neckbands themselves and tied the strings under the nightcaps beneath their chins. Under the wagon, Jack wearily turned around three times and then lay down to sleep. In the wagon, Laura and Mary said their prayers and crawled into their little bed. Ma kissed them goodnight. 
On the other side of the canvas, Pet and Patty were eating their corn. When Patty whooshed into the feed box, the whoosh was right in Laura's ear. There were little scurry sounds in the grass. In the trees by the creek, an owl hooted. Hoo, hoo. Further away, another owl answered. Hoo, hoo, hoo. Far away on the prairie, the wolves howled. And under the wagon, Jack growled low in his chest. In the wagon, everything was safe and snug. Thickly in front of the open wagon top hung the large glittering stars. Pa could reach them, Laura thought. She wished he could, would pick the largest one from the thread on which it hung from the sky and give it to her. She was wide awake. She was not sleepy at all, but suddenly she was very much surprised. The large star winked at her. Then she was waking up next morning. <gasps> That's such a good chapter. I'm so glad Jack found them. Can you imagine how far he must have gone though? Poor Jack, but he's back, yay! And that is true. I looked that up. That is a true thing that happened to them. I mean, all most of this is true. Like all of it is true. But sometimes when I read that, the kids say, "That can't. Is that really true?" It is. Jack did end up finding them. Okay, we'll go on to chapter three. Prairie day. Soft wickerings were close to Laura's ear, and grain rattled into the feed box. Pa was giving Pet and Patty their breakfast. Back, Pet. Don't be greedy. He said, "You know it's Patty's turn." Pet stepped her, stamped her foot and nickered. Now, Patty, keep your own end of the box, said Pa. This is for Pet. Then a little squeal came from Patty. Ha, got nipped, didn't you? Pa said, and it serves you right. I told you, eat your own corn. Mary and Laura looked at each other and laughed. They could smell bacon and coffee and hear pancakes sizzling, and they scrambled out of bed. Mary could dress herself all but the middle button. Laura buttoned that one for her. Then Mary buttoned Laura's all the way up her back. They washed their hands and faces in the tin wash basin on the wagon step. Ma combed every snarl out of their hair while Pa brought fresh water up from the creek. Then they sat on the clean grass and ate pancakes and bacon and molasses from their tin plate on their laps. All around them, shadows were moving and grass was waving while the sun rose. And here's a picture. Meadow larks were springing straight up from the billows of grass in the high, clear sky, singing as they went. Small, pearly clouds drifted in the intense blueness overhead. In the weed tops, tiny birds were swinging and singing in tiny voices. Pa said they were Dixie, Dixie cells. Dicky, Dicky, Laura called back to them. Dicky bird. Eat your breakfast, Laura, Ma said. You must mind your manners, even if we are a hundred miles from anywhere. Pa said mildly. It's only 40 miles to Independence, Caroline, and no doubt there's a neighbor or so nearer than that. 40 miles then, Ma agreed, but whether or not it isn't good manners to sing at the table or when you're eating, she added, because there was no table. There was only the enormous empty prairie with grasses blowing in waves, light and shadow across it, and the great blue sky above it and birds flying up from it and singing with joy because the sun was rising. And on the whole enormous prairie, there was no sign that any other human being had ever been there. In all the space of land and sky stood the lonely small covered wagon. And close to it sat Ma and Pa and Laura and Mary and baby Carrie eating their breakfast. The Mustangs munched on their corn and Jack sat still trying hard not to beg. Laura was not allowed to feed him while she ate, but she saved bits for him. And Ma made a big pancake for him with the last bit of the batter. Rabbits were everywhere in the grass and thousands of prairie chickens, but Jack could not hunt his breakfast that day. Pa was going hunting and Jack must guard the camp. First, Pa put Pet and Patty on their picket lines. Then he took the wooden tub from the side of the wagon and filled it with water from the creek. Ma was going to do the washing. Then Pa struck his sharp hatchet in his belt. Oh, sorry. Then Pa stuck his sharp hatchet in his belt and hung the powder horn beside the hatchet. He put the patch box and the bullet pouch in his pocket, and he took his gun on his arm. He said to Ma, take your time, Caroline. We won't move the wagon till we want to. We've got all the time there is. He went away, 
For a little while, they could see the upper part of him above the tall grass going away and growing smaller and smaller. Then he went out of sight and the prairie was empty. Mary and Laura washed the dishes while Ma made the beds in the wagon. They put the clean dishes neatly in the box. They picked up every scattered twig and put it in the fire. They stacked the wood against the wagon wheel. Then everything about the camp was tidy. And there's a picture of them doing the dishes and putting them into the box. I hope you guys are doing chores at home and helping. Ma brought the wooden pannikin of soft soap from the wagon. She kilted up her skirts and rolled up her sleeves and she knelt by the tub on the grass. She washed sheets and pillowcases and white underthings. She washed dresses and shirts and she rinsed them in clear water and spread them on the clean grass to dry in the sun. Mary and Laura were exploring. They must not go far from the wagon, but it was fun to run through the tall grass in the sunshine and wind. Huge rabbits bounded away before them. Birds fluttered up and settled again. The tiny dicky birds were everywhere and their tiny nests were in all the tall weeds and everywhere there were brown striped gophers. These little creatures looked soft as velvet. They had bright brown eyes and crinkling noses and wee paws. They popped out of the holes in the ground and stood up to look at Mary and Laura. Their hind legs folded under their haunches and their little paws folded tight to their chests. And they looked exactly like bits of dead wood sticking out of the ground. Only their bright eyes glittered. Mary and Laura wanted to catch one to take it to Ma. Again and again, they almost had one. The gopher would stand perfectly still until you were sure you had him this time. Then, just as you touched him, he wasn't there. There was only his round hole in the ground. Laura ran and ran and couldn't catch one. Mary sat perfectly still beside a hole, waiting for each one to come up. And just beyond her reach, gopher scampered merrily and gopher sat up and looked at her. But none came out of that hole. So there's Laura running, trying to catch one. And there's Mary looking in one hole and you can see the gophers all behind her. <laughs> Once a shadow floated across the grass and every gopher vanished. A hawk was sailing overhead. It was so close that Laura saw its cruel, sorry, its cruel curls, sorry. <laughs> it was so close that Laura saw its cruel round eye turned downward to look at her. She saw its sharp beak and its savage claws curled, ready to pounce. But the hawk saw nothing but Laura and Mary in round empty holes in the ground. It sailed away, looking for something else for its dinner. Then all the little gophers came up again. It was nearly no, noon then. The sun was almost overhead. So Laura and Mary picked flowers from the weeds and they took the flowers to Ma instead of a gopher. Ma was folding the dry clothes. She, the little panties and petticoats were whiter than snow now and warm from the sun and smelling like the grass. She laid them in the wagon and she took the flowers. She admired equally the flowers that Laura gave her and the flowers that Mary gave her and she put them together in a tin cup full of water. She set them on the wagon step to make the camp pretty. Then she split two cold corn cakes and spread them with molasses. She gave one to Mary and one to Laura. That was their dinner and it was very good. Where's the papoose, Ma? Laura asked. Don't speak with your mouth full, Laura, said Ma. So Laura chewed and swallowed and then she said, I want to see a papoose. Mercy on us, Ma said. Whatever makes you want to see Indians? We will see enough of them, more than we want to, I wouldn't wonder. They won't hurt us, would they? Mary asked. Mary was always good. She never spoke with her mouth full. No, said Ma, don't get such an idea in your head. Why don't you like Indians, Ma? Laura asked, and she caught a drip of molasses with her tongue. I just don't like them. And don't lick your fingers, Laura, said Ma. This is Indian country, isn't it? Laura asked. Why did we come to their country for if you don't like them? Ma said she didn't know whether this was Indian country or not. She didn't know where the Kansas line was, but whether or not the Indians would not be here long. Pa had word from a man in Washington that the Indian territory would be open to settlement soon. It might be ready to, it might be already open to settlement. 
they could not know because Washington was so far away. Then Ma took the satyrun out of the iron and heated it up by the fire. She sprinkled a dress for Mary and she sprinkled a dress for Laura and a dress for baby Carrie and then her own sprayed calico. She spread a blanket and a sheet on the wagon seat and she ironed all the dresses. So she's even ironing their clothes. Baby Carrie slept in the wagon. Laura and Mary and Jack lay on the shadowy grass beside it because now the sunshine was hot. Jack's mouth was open and his red tongue hung out and his eyes blinked sleepily. Ma hummed softly to herself while the iron smoothed the wrinkles out of their little dresses. All around them to the very edge of the world, there was nothing but grass waving in the wind. Far overhead, a few puffs of white clouds sailed through the thin blue air. Laura was very happy. The wind sang a low rustling song in the grass. Grasshoppers whispered from the immense prairie. A buzzing came faintly from all the trees and the creek bottoms, but all these sounds made a great warm, happy silence. Laura had never seen a place she liked so much as this place. She didn't know why, she didn't know she had gone to sleep until she woke up. Jack was on his feet, wagging his stump tail. The sun was low and Pa was coming across the prairie. Laura jumped up and ran and his long shadow stretched to meet her in the waving grasses. He held up the game in his hand for her to see. He had a rabbit, the largest rabbit she had ever seen, and two plump prairie hens. Laura jumped up and down and clapped her hands and squealed. Then she caught sight of, then she caught hold of his other sleeve and hippity hopped through the tall grass beside Pa. This country is cram jammed with game, he told her. I saw 50 deer if I saw one, and antelope and squirrels and rabbits and birds of all kind, and the creek is full of fish, he said to Ma. I tell you, Caroline, there's everything we want here. We can live like kings. That was a wonderful supper. They sat by the camp and ate the tendery, flavory meat until they could eat no more. When at last Laura set down her plate, she sighed with contentment. She didn't want anything more in the world. The last color was fading from the enormous sky and the level land was shadowy. The warmth of the fire was pleasant because the night wind was cool. Phoebe birds called sadly from the woods down by the creek. For a little while, a mockingbird sang. Then the stars came out and the birds were still. Pa softly fiddled and the music sang in the starlight. Sometimes he sang a little too and sometimes the fiddle sang alone. Sweet and thin and far away, the fiddle went on singing. The large bright stars hung down from the sky. Lower and lower they came, quivering with music. Laura gasped and Ma came quickly. What is it, Laura? She asked and then Laura whispered, the stars were singing. You've been asleep, Ma said. It's only the fiddle and it's time the little girls were in bed. She undressed Laura in the firelight and put her nightgown on and tied her nightcap and tucked her into her bed. But the fiddle was still singing in the starlight. The night was full of music and Laura was sure that part of it came from the great bright stars swinging so low above the prairie. Okay, so that was the end of that chapter. And there's one picture I didn't show you. This is Ma ironing in the back of the wagon. Okay, well, I'm so glad they found Jack and so far so good on the prairie. We'll find out what happens next.